evening and welcome everyone. We will get started here in a few minutes. There's people still filing in and we're excited to see you tonight. Normally, we would be racing in after our heated softball and volleyball games. When we're in person, that's typically what we do in front of the state of the ASA. So since we're not doing that, I thought I'd bring uh, in uh, the balls to show you what we have to look forward to when we're back in person next year. We're happy to see you tonight for the State of the ASA. This is an annual opportunity for us to join as members to hear about the past year and the exciting plans for our future. You've heard us say that 2021 is ASA's 80th anniversary and in 20 short years, we'll be celebrating our centenary. So tonight, we will take a look at sharing our vision for our 100th year anniversary. You're going to hear from Executive Council President Terry Gray, uh, Executive Director John Wood. The keynote address will be given by Steve Machia. Then I will provide a financial and operational overview, and we will recognize our 50-year members. We will also induct the Class of 2021 Fellows we will uh, recognize our members who have passed into glory, and then we will hear a student testimonial by Michael Hahn. Hannah Eagleson will be uh, presenting our student awards this year and talk about our scholarship fund, and then John will give us a glimpse into what we have to look forward to for the next couple of years for our upcoming annual meetings. So we look forward to being here with you tonight. And for right now, I'm going to turn it over to Terry Gray. Thank you, Vicki. Um, good evening, everyone. And you can see from the picture slide, that doesn't look like me, but um, it's coming back soon um, uh, in a, in, uh, shortly. Um, so uh, welcome to uh, this uh, State of the ASA meeting. Uh, and. I know some of you are in the evening and some of you are in the afternoon, uh, but we're glad you're here. Um, I only have a few uh, words to say, but I think uh, it's uh, it tackles an important issue. Uh, so um, one thing um, I do want to do before I start is to uh, just introduce the executive council members. Uh, and there uh, you see the um, seven of us listed, myself, uh, Mike Everest, uh, Bill Jordan, Ifa Zaiden, um, Janet um, Curry, Say Kim, and Dominic um, uh, <laughs> Kalsmer. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and so uh, they're, they're part of this process, and I'm kind of reporting what they uh, want, want me to report. One thing I wanted to uh, point out, uh, you know, this has been a difficult year. A lot of organizations have had uh, trouble even surviving in it. And uh, we have found that the ASA has actually uh, thrived in this uh, environment. And uh, we've been able to have uh, new sorts of meetings. Um, our, our January meeting, uh, our uh, Local section meetings have now expanded uh, uh, because of the pre their presence on the internet so that everybody uh, can be involved who's interested in that particular topic. And uh, we've, we've had um, the, jan the um, uh, Diving Deeper series happening. Uh, there's just been a lot of great things happening in the ASA uh, because of this. Now we're all eager to get back to uh, live interaction. Uh, but I think uh, one thing that I read in Science Magazine not long ago is that most organizations who have been successful are planning to keep a, some kind of digital uh, activity going with their meetings. And we're going to uh, see that with uh, ASA as well. Um, so that's sort of an interesting twist on how uh, this is uh, changing the way we are. Um, I want to leave us with uh, just a, a, a thought about the character of the ASA that has uh, was mentioned early in the meeting and is evident throughout the meeting. We're a big tent uh, organization. 
Um, you know, we we don't have a we have a statement of faith. Um, I'll you know just remind you of the four planks, uh, the authority of Scripture, um, sort of basic Christianity um, in the ecumenical creeds, uh, and uh, a, a fourth plank about uh, the um, uh, about creation and uh, the God has created and He sustains all things, but He has done it in such a way that it's accessible. Uh, with the tools of science, uh, and then fourthly, a uh, uh, the idea of stewardship and uh, responsible uh, care of of God's creation, uh, as far as we're concerned. And th th that's it for the statement of faith of the ASA. Not that that's a, a minor thing, um, but we don't take stands on uh, various controversial issues, even like uh, like. Uh, creation and the, the methods of creation and how God made the world. You know, we have young earth creationists. Uh, we have uh, old earth creationists. We have evolutionary um, uh, biologists among us. Um, and, and we have different ways of uh, reconciling that with, uh, with the Genesis accounts. And, uh, you know, we have uh, all various stripes of uh, Christians who think about how creation happened uh, differently when it comes to their specific details. But as a, uh, an organization, we don't take a particular stand. And so we welcome and have among us all of those uh, different stripes of, of Christians. Um, and we could think about that on lots of different areas. Uh, we don't all agree. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't talk to each other. And it doesn't mean we can't um, present our views. Uh, we, we do that, and we try to persuade each other, uh, but we respectfully listen and, and dialogue, and, and that's part of the ASA. But I want to mention uh, uh, two more that we um, have. There's a whole host that we could talk about, but creation care is one. Creation care is actually in our statement of, uh, of, of faith, our basic commitments. Um, but when it comes to fleshing out some of the details of creation care, you know, to what degree do uh, human beings uh, get emphasized over other creatures where there's any kind of conflict? There's a whole variety of viewpoints in the ASA. And, you know, we embrace that uh, diversity. And then one to mention, um, just sort of at the at the very end uh, here, uh, that's particularly timely is is COVID and how uh, how ASA. What's the ASA stand on on COVID? Well, we don't have a stand. Like we don't have a stand on evolution. We don't have a stand on uh, the details of creation care. We don't have a stand on uh, various other issues. Um, and so you know. Most, I would guess, most of us have had a COVID vaccine and uh, think that that's the right thing to do. Uh, but we want to recognize that there may be Christians who take a different view on that and have um, an alternate opinion. Uh, they're more cautious. You know, the, the uh, government agencies responsible are, ha have made this an emergency uh, a vaccine at this point. Uh, and so, uh, it's, you know, it still has some questions about it, even though, you know, we're encouraging most people to, to get it. Um, and we can espouse that kind of diversity uh, even in the ASA. And so um, I hope you've seen that throughout the meeting. I've certainly seen it. And uh, we want to allow that, be gracious to one another. We can talk to each other. We can try to persuade each other. but our goal is to be thinking uh, Christianly and to help each other think Christianly uh, about these issues. And so, I, you know, as we brought, uh, just started discussing about what we would say, uh, we just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Our, we stand on a very, very common ground of the creeds and, and this, these basic ideas. But beyond that, there's a rich diversity uh, in the ASA and among us. And so um, hopefully you can embrace that. 
uh, our members embrace that, uh, and uh, we can have good, gracious, productive conversations with, with each other. And now I'm going to stop there and turn it over to John. Thank you, Terry. Pretty appreciate that. Good evening, everyone. After 18 long months of COVID chaos, I'm happy to uh, second Terry's opinion here that these and report to you the state of the ASA this year is excellent. Uh, tonight, we're meeting in this virtual meeting space. And in doing so, we're experiencing one of the most tangible expressions of the robust health of the ASA. Who would have imagined that just two short decades ago that we'd actually be engaging our membership in a virtual meeting space right across North America and around the world? If you have never been to an ASA event, a special welcome to this State of the ASA evening. Our tradition as an affiliation is one of meeting in the summer each year for the content that you've seen over the last few days, and then this evening for reports from our leadership, the Executive Council, uh, from Terry, and from the management and leadership team of the ASA. These meetings are focused on our goals and strategies for achieving our mission and the means in which uh, that happens. So tonight we continue that tradition, but we're also adding some, several new elements. I think you're gonna really enjoy them. Uh, we're gonna have a uh, plenary speaker, a very interesting one coming up and, and some things with partners. You'll see those things coming. So we are celebrating 80 years of excellence in the ASA. That's a remarkable feat for any organization. Um, there are few organizations that, uh, can manage that uh, experience of reaching eight decades. So where have we been in this last few years? Uh, the Executive Council this last year in particular has focused on mission and our vision and clarifying that, you're gonna hear about that. We've worked on governance on the Executive Council level and we've looked on, worked on activities uh, in management side to build our capacity as an organization. And of course, the council is thinking about leadership uh, going forward in, in an executive search. There are three words that characterize the ASA today, change, clarity, and courage. The ASA at 80 is what is called a very mature nonprofit organization. We note that of all nonprofits that form each year, only about one in 10 survive the, even the first decade. This, is, this year, the ASA is celebrating its 80th anniversary and that's remarkable longevity. Yet with age and any human enterprise can come forgetting and drifting from the founding vision. Tragically, we have seen that happen this year in several evangelical organizations. So mission fidelity, not just longevity, is a concern for our members. Change is a necessity for variability and viability, pardon me, in institutions as well as in people. And health is a good metaphor for life of an institution. The Executive Council, uh, next slide. The Executive Council recently gave a close reading to Mission Drift the Unspoken Crisis Facing Leaders, Charities, and Churches. This is an award-winning book by Peter Greer and Chris Forrest, Successful Leaders of Nonprofits. And we learn there that there are two primary markers of institutional mission drift. Missions, organizations started drifting away from their founding uh, statements and goals as a gospel organization first. That's one marker. And secondly, Organizations can fail to thrive. They fail to grow and develop and change. And that's a signal of health in any organization, but it's also clearly for us. We take our children in and we have developmental markers. And if they're not hitting those markers, we begin to ask ourselves, okay, what do we need to do to change? The ASA is a gospel organization. And that is clear. But how so? This might be... Uh, the, this might not be the way that we would typically describe ourselves as a gospel organization or 
certainly not as an evangelistic. That's not our primary uh, expression of being. However, at this meeting, we have seen the power of the gospel at work in the lives of our members, in the testimony of what they do, and what Terry was talking about. We present ourselves as a platform for a diversity of views. I like to think of us as a Galatians 3 kind of organization, that we are not looking for the differences so much in ourselves as we are join, pardon me, joining together. You know, this year in phone calls and in emails to our members, the team heard of the vital role that ASA plays in growing in their lives in faith and service. As scholars and as professionals with interest at the intersection of faith and science, we are all engaging and doing the work that God has gifted and called us to do. Throughout the history of the ASA, this has been a unique space for conversation. Jennifer Wiseman, an ASA fellow and director of the Dozier program, AAAS, recently put it this way, the ASA and Dozier function as portals of service to our nation and to the world. Now that is a heady definition of an organization that is doing kingdom work. Many people see the faith and science uh, area through the lens of issues, but we actually think it's better to see it through our calling and our vocation, and in particular through the ASA as this kind of social formation. We're an institution existing to nourish the walk and faith vocationally of our members. So let's turn to mission next. This is an expression of it in this slide. Our mission is really clear, and it's unchanging. We examined it carefully. Terry has reiterated it for you. So our mission is clear in terms of integration, in terms of service to the church, in terms of strengthening scholarship, in terms of our fellowship. And we are based in scriptures, looking at both aspects of the biblical revelation and the revelation of God in nature. Council is, understands that. But while our mission is clear, next slide, it turns out that our vision is changing. Our governance practices, for instance, have been changing, and we're updating them with the bylaws, and we're updating our practices, too, in the council. We've extended committees, and we involve other members and feed in. So there's a, a lot of governance practice, and our management is changing. We're changing in the office. So there's an awful lot of the expression of our mission and building of capacity to express that mission that's going on. And finally, we know that our executive leadership, too, will be changing. I am in an interim executive director role. The council has wisely said we'll retain that title to signal to people, and I like that signal, that this is a transition. So I'm not going to be in here for years and years and years, but we are preparing the ground for the future of the ASA. Next slide. In pursuit of our mission, we're asking three questions. And Steve Machia later this evening will, will help us in thinking about that. But we, he came in and helped the council in asking these first questions. Why does the ASA exist? Why are we here? What are we for? Without the ASA, one of our council members asked, what would go missing if ASA disappeared? This is kind of like that television program, right? In, uh, you know, the missing history one on PBS. And you think, oh, I'll roll back and imagine. What if the ASA was not here as a space for these conversations? And of course, the next question, what are we doing next? And that's the next slide. We have to have courage. We have to have courage to lead change. And I applaud the courage of our council and the courage of our team to be willing to adapt and change. And you saw this week, and throughout this meeting, an expression of just raw courage. I mean, we went into this without ever having done this before, not knowing uh, exactly what, how things were going to go. And that takes real courage. It takes courage for an organization to apologize when it's wrong. And we navigated that uh, very difficult and continue to do so. And, and 
because we are a big tent, because we entertain the most controversial issues within the church, we know that sometimes we just are not going to get it right. And we ask forgiveness when we don't. And we do that as a body and informally, but we also try and do that individually. Because we want to grow into new ways of being faithful in our mission. And you heard expressions of that new language in the plenary talks and in the contributed papers. People are struggling to get what's the new way of thinking about ourselves in this challenging space we find ourselves in. Next slide. So what's this change look like? Well, there's lots of new member services and here they are listed and I've talked about them and many of you have experienced them. The goal here is in the box. It is supporting our members in their gifting and calling. We've often asked, I've been on council for the last five years and I've been around the ASA for many years. And we ask ourselves, what should we do? That's an expression of, of our mission. What should we do? And as we've thought about that and talked about it and in conversations, uh, Vicki and I, in particular, in our phone calls with partner organizations and affiliates and members, you know, the thing that keeps coming back is, oh, the ASA has really helped me think. They've helped us in thinking about what we do, what God is asking us to do. And this facilitating role seems to be an important piece of what we can do. And of course, we express it in these really interesting uh, interactions, repurposing our uh, plenary speakers in Brown Baggers, the diving deeper, which takes our perspectives and has just leveraged the power of those, those scholarly articles to a much larger audience and to a deeper extent. We've added a career center. If you haven't seen that, we did a soft launch with it. And if you haven't been there, we have members who've discovered this career center and are populating that if you're an employer and you want a, a talented uh, Christian working with you, Put an ad in our career center. If you're looking for a place, come on into the career center. The more we use it, the more it will develop. Think of it as a kind of uh, ASA AI approach, right? Use this career center more and it's going to get more and more powerful. And then Terry mentioned the local chapters, our capacity to support them. And finally, these virtual meetings. Next. So it looks like an expanded team capacity. You've seen Mark, here's the wizard behind the screen. I mean, he's, he's the main tech guy, but it's the entire team. We've been growing a, what we call a cross-functional team, working at different things and different, we're, we all have our specialties and we all cooperate together. And we're looking for a communication specialist. So well, there's a space, become part of our team. Next. So, the other piece that you may have seen, local chapters, it's kind of a three-part model of our service model. How do we serve our members? We do it through the annual meetings, but we do it through local chapters. We built that out. We're working with our affiliates. Affiliates are a professional association. So it is the Christian women in science around a, a, an identity group, the um, a, a Christian engineers, the Christians and uh, geologists, and we have others that are not as well developed, but are in the process of forming. So affiliates to give that focus. And then finally, our active partnerships. And you've seen that on display this afternoon with InterVarsity and the Marvelous Emerging Scholars Network. And you see, saw it through the entire weekend with the Henry Center. But we have others that, uh, that happen throughout the year. And we're developing more of these partnership relationships so that we can leverage what others are doing for the benefit of our members. Next slide. So now is the future. We're in, what will the ASA centenary look like? How are we serving our members with the gift of science, science, knowledge for the body of Christ, for the common good? Well, we're going to find out about that shortly. Next slide, I think that, oh by Steve Machia. And I'm going to introduce Steve next. So who is Steve? 
Steve Mockey. Let me tell you about the Reverend Dr. Stephen Mockey. He has a pastor's heart. He has a leader's keen eye, and he is a gifted, has gifted managers and managerial skilled hands. This is a rare combination. It is so necessary for leading successful faith-based nonprofit enterprises today. And Steve is the founder and president, as you know, of Leadership Transformations Incorporated. I, Steve, I love that name. It means that you don't just aspire to make change but you have organized yourself and you emphasize your business model to make it happen in the lives of your clients and your partners and in your team. Leadership Transformations, Inc. I, that's a great name. Steve is a facilitator. He's a ministry mentor. He's a spiritual director. He's written 15 books, two of which the ASA leadership team have studied and are applying. He has been on numerous boards, including the executive uh, board of the National Association of Evangelicals. He writes in Church Executive Magazine. He teaches in the Doctor of Ministry program at Gordon Conwell Seminary on spiritual re replenishment. He's really interested in soul care. There's much more to say about Steve, but you know enough to know that the, last January, this is why the Executive Council invited him to our board retreat to help us focus on mission. And in March, Steve facilitated a day-long retreat with our team. We were working through his book, Becoming a Healthy Team. Nearly all of us at the ASA experience working teams. And uh, we have a, a God-given desire to flourish in the place where we have been called and gifted. Throughout this COVID chaos, Steve has become a wise counselor for our leadership team. Vicki and I really appreciate his insights. Tonight, we've asked Steve to speak to us on flourishing and the mission of the ASA. We think there are lessons to be learned as Steve comes to speak to us about the ASA 80 years young. Steve, welcome. Uh, thank you for your kind words of introduction, John, and for the privilege that's mine to share just a few brief remarks with you during your annual meeting. I don't have any PowerPoint presentations, so you'll have the privilege of just sort of looking at each other and um, hearing, hopefully, uh, my heart expressed to yours. I want to thank you as well for designating LTI, I believe, as the recipient of your Sunday morning offering. I'm overwhelmed with your kindness to our team, your generosity on behalf of all of us at LTI, and I want to extend my, my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you. I'm new to the ASA. I barely passed biology, chemistry, and physics in high school, so you'll have to forgive me for that. And instead, I went into the social sciences, if you will, the fields of education and ministry in college and seminary instead. I'm more comfortable understanding people dynamics than the environmental, chemical, or physical aspects of our world but I've got nothing but the highest regard for those who are in the scientific community and who help us understand the why and how of so much of our natural world. Ruth and I just, my wife and I just returned from two weeks in Alaska where the creative order was on full display and where I learned about fjords and glaciers and wildlife while enjoying the best salmon and halibut I think I've ever eaten. Over the past year or so, as I've gotten to know the ASA, I've been deeply impressed by the staff and the board teams who lead you all so, so well. I, I have to say a huge shout out to John Wood and Vicki Best in particular. These two are absolutely amazing people. Over the past 18 years, LTI has worked with hundreds of organizations like the ASA all across the country and in other parts of the world, from the Salvation Army to local churches, denominational networks, parachurch ministries, schools, seminaries, and even Christian-led businesses. So what we love seeing are Christian organizations like the ASA come alive in Christ, strengthen their teams, 
and serve others with relational vibrancy, leadership creativity, and spiritual depth. And I've seen some of this firsthand, and I rejoice with you on your 80th birthday. Now, as a social scientist, I can tell you there are healthy 80-year-olds and there are unhealthy 80-year-olds. And I don't mean simply their physical capabilities. I know several 80-year-olds. Some are still very, very young at heart. They're vibrant, they're joyful, they're full of life. They pour themselves into the next generation. And there are others, frankly, who are, well, old. Old-fashioned, old-schooled, old-minded, and simply old. Out of touch, stuck in the past, unwilling to patch, pass the torch, to the next generation, always needing to be right and in the center of attention, and surprisingly selfish and immature. I'm sure you know this truth, dear friends. Age does not always equal maturity. So when I see an 80-year-old organization hosting a Francis Collins webinar, around the pandemic and 1,700 people are in attendance from 40 countries around the world, I'm like, they're 80, but they're more agile and up-to-date than most 25-year-olds. That's a wow. That's a wow of accomplishment for any organization. But especially, it's noteworthy for an 80-year-old group. That's just the tip of the iceberg. That's what's so amazing. That one illustration is just one of so many others. This agile 80-year-old organization that's on the cusp of the greatest days ahead. You've, you've taken on many innovative initiatives recently. You've nearly completed a legacy campaign that's raised millions of dollars for your, from your constituency for important work in the future. Legacy. What a great word. What a great word for an 80-year-old organization. When I hear that, I think future, as in our best years are yet to come. And I've come to believe with your leaders that indeed that's true. Your best days are yet to come. The question is, do you believe that? Do you believe that true for yourself? that the best days for ASA are yet to come. You see, what I've come to believe about the ASA is that you're a movement more than you're an organization. You're a living network more than a superficial affiliation. You've got moxie and talent and resources and energy and passion and vision. And you have a track record to build on. You've grown, you've multiplied, you've planted, and you've sown lots of very, very good, outstanding ministry. There is so much to be grateful for and so much to praise God for together. And I hope you are together. So with 80 years behind you, the question that I want to ask, and Vicki already posed it and so did John, what will you look like at 100? Because it's not that far away, friends. Therefore, it's best to prepare today for what's ahead. Discerning together the way forward is indeed the journey that you must take together. It's a journey of great joy, I might add, because growing naturally, organically, and abundantly, like any other healthy living thing, whether seen through a telescope or a microscope, and with clarity, watching and waiting and working toward healthy growth. That's the change, that's the charge for now and for the future. And John's already outlined what those big words are. That's what you're charged to do today for the sake of your future. You've been an issues-oriented and fellowship-centered organization. Your personal, professional life has been enhanced significantly. Your scientists 
and academicians and practitioners, and you're often feeling quite lonely out there as a Christ follower. But you've seen ASA as a community of like-minded, faith-based leaders, and you feel very much at home here at ASA. That's fabulous. Don't lose the joy of companionship, camaraderie, and professional banter. It is so good for the soul of ASA, and it strengthens your witness indeed. I find it interesting as well that, that Jesus was a scientist of sorts, a bit more inclined toward the miraculous as the all-knowing Messiah, but he was also incredibly aware of how healthy growth happens in this world and among his people. He'd be a great ASA member, right? His teachings were, they were littered with insights about the growth and interconnectedness of human and biological life. And he was a carpenter, so he knew his, his trees. He was a storyteller, and he knew his agricultural audience. Jesus knew that in order for something healthy to grow, it needed the soil and nutrients to aid their flourishing. Notably, in his teaching, the parable of the sower, the seeds and the soil, this parable is really a parable of what I like to describe as the parable of the soul. Luke 8 is the location of this parable. You know it well. A farmer sows seed. As he was scattering his seed, some of it fell on the path where it was quickly trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because of lack of moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell upon good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. It's a wonderful lesson in earth sciences. And his point in telling this parable is to stress that the seed is the word of God and the soil of the soul in which it's planted matters a lot. It's kind of simple, rather a first grade story of how things grow. We prepare the soil, we plant seeds, we wait, we watch, we water, we nourish, we celebrate, we watch this amazing fruitfulness come from great rootedness, and we watch it flourish. But such seeds don't do well in soils that are moisture deficient, such as hard or rocky or thorny soil. No, the seedlings need good soil, not only for the word of God to grow, but the people of God for them to flourish too. You see, this parable isn't just about the unconverted, as it's so often portrayed in preaching and teaching settings. It's also for us as believers. Where we reside and the soil we occupy matters. For the generosity of God is always to scatter seeds. And he does so extravagantly, indiscriminately, regardless of the condition of the soil. So the question for us is, are we posturing ourselves to receive the seed as good soil, with a noble and good heart, so that by persevering, sometimes even for 80 years, we will produce a crop 100 times what was sown? Yes, I believe Jesus was a great scientist and would do well teaching a class on plant life and growth, the importance of soil, moisture, and nutrition. Wouldn't you agree? The Apostle Paul also is a scientist, and he continues this legacy of scientific reflection when he talks about the human body as the analogy for leadership and church life. His point was that every part of the body 
matters. Each is interconnected and interdependent upon the other. All the parts are necessary in order for the whole body to flourish. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul uses the word body 17 times, like a good teacher. Repeat, 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 repeat. And good students of the word know that when a word is repeated, we're supposed to pay attention to that word. It's almost like Paul was talking to a group of people that weren't listening very well. So he had to repeat himself over and over and over again. And he says that word 17 times in just about the same number of verses. Over and over and over again, Paul is calling the church to unity, oneness, togetherness, community. It's one of his major themes in all of his writings. Be united, he says. Be united in heart, mind, and purpose. From that unity, the people of God, the body of Christ, flourishes. So there you have it, Jesus and Paul. And frankly, every one of the New Testament authors, they knew that the point of the gospel was all about the heart and the soul. The good soil of the soul and the unified health of the souls of each member of the body. Because it's the inner life of the leader and the learner that matters the most. The core of your vitality, individually and collectively, and the center of the universe, the epicenter of our flourishing, is the soul. On a recent call with John Wood and Vicki Best, John used a phrase that for him was a throwaway, but for me, it stuck out large. John said, the ASA is essential to the flourishing of God's kingdom. Essential to the flourishing of God's kingdom, I said. And he said, yes, and he meant it. It's not just for any organization, but for this one. Do you believe that ASA is essential to the flourishing of God's kingdom? John believes it. I've come to believe it. I hope you believe it too. ASA is one of those essential body parts that Jesus references in his analogy of the good soil and the Apostle Paul references in 1 Corinthians 12. Now, I'm not sure if you're the soil that looks like an Iowa farm or if your body analogy is that you're the hands or the feet or the brain or the joints or the lungs. But regardless of how deep and dark your soil may be or what part you play in the body, you are essential for the flourishing of God's kingdom. John, thank you for that word. And you need each other in order to function well together. That's the indisputable evidence to the hypothesis that John Wood has proposed. How's that for scientific language? I'm trying. I'm really trying. <laughs> so, so how will you flourish together? I'm convinced because I'm involved every day in the soul care of leaders and teams that you will only flourish as a ministry, as an organization, when your soul is right with God when your soul is open to the work of God, when your soul is pliable, teachable, malleable to the fresh movement of God's Spirit. Friends, your soul matters. It is of utmost importance. In fact, I'm sure you agree with me that there's really no other part of you that's more important than your soul. But unfortunately, dear scientists, it's almost impossible to study the soul under a microscope or with a telescope. Instead, you need a stethoscope. With the soul at the center, we can then consider the structures and people that support the health of the soul, the strategy for enhancing our shared efforts and work the stewardship to build upon as we fulfill our communal efforts as the ASA, and in the service we offer to others in Jesus' name. Yes, the soul 
is essential for flourishing. If the ASA is to be an essential part of that flourishing. So your soul, my soul, your brother and sister next to you at work and in support of your efforts as scientists who are blending faith with your, with your endeavors, their soul and your soul matter to God, to one another, and to the ASA of the future. So tonight, tonight I challenge you to prioritize your own soul. Keep it in good soil. Put that at the top of your priority daily priority list and help those you serve with to do likewise. As your brothers and sisters in Jesus, members of the living body of Christ, then from that place of heart and soul flourishing, go forth to learn and teach and write and research and rub shoulders and discover new insights together as a movement, a network, a community known as the ASA. You see, the ASA over the years has been written out, written about and publicly shared over and over and over again. You have more life-giving stories and testimonies than Carter's has pills. You were once lonely, faith-based scientists, but now you are known, loved, admired, and appreciated as a result of your ASA connections. You were once the lone voice for the scientific method in your local church, but then you found your home in ASA, and as a result, your local church has become a more friendly place to habitate. You found your safe place here at the ASA, and I know you're grateful beyond words. And your work has flourished in your particular setting. That's your story 100-fold as a result of good soil for the seeds to grow in. And that is what we praise God for tonight. We praise God for your story. Your story, dear scientists, brothers and sisters in Christ, your stories that have flourished and have seen a new day, a new era, a new experience, a new heritage, a new legacy, because of the years that you have been faithful, 80 years of faithful service upon which you will lead the future generation of scientists who are seeking to blend their faith with their scientific minds and hearts blended together. But without a soul, you will die. Without a soul, you will do nothing because you'll just be a bunch of talking heads talking about issues of the day, but having nothing different about you than scientific expression X, Y, or Z elsewhere. What sets you apart is your, your Christian commitment, your courage, your convictions, and they matter, and they are fed by the soul, the place that God is doing his new and renewing and ever-present work in. So tonight I want to encourage you and exhort you. First, the encouragement. I want to encourage you to carry on the legacy of the first 80 years with the certain hope that your best days are yet ahead of you. I want to say that again. I want you all, I want to encourage you all to believe that the best days for the ASA are ahead of you. That's leadership. That's leadership. And that's why you're here at this annual meeting, because you care about the leadership of the ASA. If you care about leadership and you are a leader, then you need to know and recognize and appreciate that the best days are yet ahead. I'm now in my 60s. I'm having a hard time believing that because I remember the glory days. I remember the glory days of church. I remember the glory days of this and the glory days of that. And I, and I relish those glory days. But guess what? The best is yet to come because the next generation needs the best of us to be given over to them 
so that they experience the best of the ASA in the future. So I want to encourage you, hold fast to the promises of God. Love one another in spite of your differences. Don't become like another organization that gets split and angry and frustrated at each other because we have differences. No, you know you have differences. Celebrate those differences and do so in a loving, kind, grace-filled way. Believe God is a community for a promising future. And beginning tonight, know that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. That's yet to come. So you stand on solid ground. You have good soil. You have the seed of the sower to plant and grow for today and into the future. So lean on the promises of God, planted in good soil for the glory of God and the flourishing of the kingdom of God. That's my encouragement. Now my exhortation. I want to exhort you to care for your own soul and come alongside one another and help each other stay strong in the Lord, to serve God together within the scientific community and beyond, united as one in the body of Christ, even, as, even in, in spite of your differences. Make soul care your number one priority every single day of your life. And I guarantee, I guarantee, your walk with God and your work together at ASA will be significantly enhanced as you do so. Be in the word, pray, reflect, slow down, Sabbath, be renewed from the inside out. Our shared wisdom and maturity will only be healthy and spot on in the discernment that we practice if we do so by preferring God each and every day. So I exhort you to hold hands and stick together, one in Christ for the flourishing of the kingdom of God. Friends, this day that we're living in is dark and our culture is rather hopeless. But we, the ASA, we can offer light and hope, peace and joy because we belong to the living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And we belong to one another as the people of God God's precious possession, his beloved children. So no matter what the challenges may be ahead of us, we know that without a shadow of a doubt that God will lead us by the hand into flourishing and greener pastures beside quiet waters and with the knowledge that he truly wants us to daily and continually restore our soul. May it be so, ASA, now and into the future. Let's pray that God in his infinite and matchless wisdom and love will protect, preserve, and provide for the ASA in every way needed in order to stay essential to the flourishing of the kingdom of God. Today and into the future, as 80-year-old organization and in anticipation of becoming a 100-year organization. May it be so in each of your hearts and lives, and may it be so collectively as this amazing network of people who are blending sciences, the sciences and our faith together for the glory of God. So Father, may it be so. May these every one of these members of the ASA, may they believe together in you and your hand of blessing upon them, how you have directed their steps and provided for their needs for these 80 years and how you will continue to do so in the future. Help them by your grace to be uh, receivable soil so that the seed of your word can come in and take root and grow a hundredfold. And may they be the body of Christ, one member attached to another, all for the glory of Jesus and all for the building up of his kingdom. May it be so. May it be so. 
and we will give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen and amen. Steve, thank you so very much. I'm without words. I'm so grateful for your friendship and your partnership. And I too am grateful for the ways that God is accomplishing his purposes in and through the ASA. And I too believe that the best is yet to come for the ASA. And you all need to know that I feel called and I'm very passionate about the work that I do here at the ASA. It's an absolute joy and privilege to work with John and the team to carry out the mission of the ASA. And I'm seeing here 118 people on this meeting, and there's 118 stories to be told. And as I travel the country in, the, in North America, visiting with each and every one of you, it is an absolute privilege to hear your story and to hear how the ASA has meant to you and how you learned about the ASA and what it has meant to you over the years. So again, Steve, thank you very much for being here with us. And we appreciate all that you've said and all that you've done for us. We're very grateful. I am going to now shift gears and give a financial and operational overview. And thinking about the last year, there's many, many highlights to talk about. Terry talked about the fact that we're not only surviving, but we are thriving in the midst of COVID. We quickly pivoted and repositioned our business model. We were able to uh, attain a PPP loan. We balanced our budget with a modest surplus. Plus, we exceeded our fundraising goals. We enhanced member services. We've had great staff team building with Steve and strategic planning conversations with the council. You've heard John talk about the successful online programming. We have continued excellence in our journal and God in Nature. We've developed a planned giving program, and we are in conversation about legacy giving and the growth of our endowment fund. So much to be thankful for. And God, in his providence, has thrust us into this new normal. The team, as you have all witnessed this weekend, have become Zoom experts. If only we had the foresight to invest in Zoom stock a year and a half ago, all our financial problems would be solved. Many of you may be familiar with Andy Crouch and Company's article called Leading Through the Blizzard. And in that article, they talked about whether this COVID um, chaos would be a winter storm, a blizzard, or an ice age. And we're all very um, obvious that it's an ice age. And uh, we have managed to navigate the COVID chaos in ways that we would have never thought or imagined, uh, thanks be to God. Many ASA-sponsored online events, we have served over 3,000 people worldwide over the last year in these events that John has already talked about, the Summer Something Series, the Brown Bag Lunches, the Diving Deeper Discussions, our member assemblies, and the Winter Symposium with Francis Collins. And like Steve mentioned, we had about 2,000 people from all over the world um, in that winter symposium and many hits on YouTube, YouTube as well. So again, something we could have never thought or imagined uh, has worked out for his good. In terms of our member services, John talked about the 500 member calls that we made during COVID, again, an intentional way to engage with our members. The chapters are going great guns under Dana's leadership. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Our affiliates are all strong and we've got a, a renewed relationship with CSCA. Our CWIS affiliate group has a, an amazing leadership team and is revitalized and really thriving. Um, we have some events planned over the next few months so be on the lookout for those. The engineering and geologist affiliate group are in process with be, being revitalized as well. So again, 
some really neat things going on with our affiliate groups. And again, John talked about our partnership growth in uh, many of the member run organizations. And so John and I have been on many, many calls over the last year and a half with many of our partners and very encouraged with the relationship building that we're doing in that area as well. And as we look at it, it we're, we're describing it as intentional, uh, holistic view of our members. And in the last year, we've really engaged more members, more resources than we ever have in the ASA. And so we're very, very pleased with that. In terms of the local chapters, we have 35 chapters or 36 chapters now across North America, 25 in the US and 11 in Canada. We have four student chapters going strong and you will hear in a minute from Michael Hahn, one of the leaders of the Gordon student chapter. I saw somebody ask in, in chat, how many members does the ASA have? And we've got about 1,900 members uh, around the world and another uh, almost 200 uh, subscribers and another 2,200 followers for a total of about 4,500 members. And again, the chapters are, are really um, going strong and we've had about 52 virtual meetings in 2020 and another 33 in 2021 so far, again, it's a new opportunity for chapters. And what's been neat about it is several of the chapters have partnered together to host events. And we've seen many people that have been in, in different geographic regions jump into chapter meetings that have been of interest to them. So again, something that's been very positive in the midst of COVID is the, um, the chapter engagement. And none of this that I've just described would not be possible without this awesome team that you've heard John and I talk about. It's a cross-functional team with a very broad skill set. Some of them work in the office in Topsfield with me, and some of them are remote. But I'm just going to quickly, uh, again, introduce them all. Becky English is our membership and outreach manager here in the Topsfield office. Becky just gave a wave. Uh, she has an a MBA and an extensive management background, and so she is serving us very well in this role. Lynn Berg has been with us for 28 years in the role of managing editor, and she is our institutional memory, and it's a joy to, to work alongside Lynn. You heard John say uh, Mark is the newest member to our team as the digital content specialist, and uh, Mark is multi-talented, as you have witnessed over the course of this weekend, and we're just thrilled to have him on board with us. Dana is our chapter and affiliate manager. Uh, she hails from Ohio, but is here in Boston with us for the weekend, and Dana has really been responsible for the thriving of our chapters and helping us uh, revitalize the affiliates, so it's a, a joy to work alongside Dana as well. You heard me mention Randy Isaac is still located here in the Boston area and is now our diving deeper moderator and also continues to be our IT consultant. And so we see Randy on a fairly regular basis here in the office as well. Hannah Eagleson, you've seen throughout the conference. Uh, she was instrumental in the uh, start of the ESN relationship five years ago and her and Bob Truby have been a wonderful partners of the ASA over the last year and years. And we deeply value that relationship. Sigart and Aniko Albert are a duo um, with God and Nature as editor in chief and managing editor. And it's a joy to work with them. Jim Peterson continues to do great work with the journal and we're grateful for his uh, service here as well. And Natalie Swetlin is our new intern here in the office. She's a Gordon student and we're delighted to have her on board with us as well. Steve talked a bit about uh, soul care in his talk and one of the things that we've really made an intentional effort to do here on the team is to take the time that we need uh, for Sabbath and rest and relaxation on the weekends and not to be working 24-7, and we spend a lot of time in prayer. We pray every 
day at lunch. Uh, we have weekly staff meetings where we are in prayer. And so prayer is a, a real priority of ours. And um, it's been a privilege to be able to come together, to get to know each other personally, and to be able to pray for each other. Now I'm going to shift gears and provide a, a very brief financial update. Uh, some of you may be aware of the fact that the ASA is a member of the Evangelical Council on Financial Accountability, and we abide by the seven standards of responsible stewardship. I'm going to talk a little bit about our uh, fiscal 21 results and our development efforts and organizational capacity. So first, the financial update. Our fiscal year ended on uh, March 31st, and we uh, exceeded our budget from a, a revenue perspective. Uh, when COVID hit, uh, John and I had just presented a budget to the council, and we quickly had to go back to the drawing board and we repositioned the budget by 25%. Simultaneously, we applied for a PPP loan through the SBA in an effort to preserve our staff. That was our number one priority. We were uh, granted a loan, uh, very grateful for that. And we were able to receive 100% forgiveness as well. So that was $50,000. And so again, that was an answer to prayer. And with the canceled annual meeting from last year, um, that uh, loan in addition to the uh, charitable giving um, allowed us to come in over our budget. And then we were able to come in under budget a bit on our expenses. So God really surprised us in a number of ways. And we were able to end the year with a modest surplus and bring that forward into fiscal 22. I'm going to move to the next slide now, Becky. So just taking a look at uh, the development efforts. And again, what I just mentioned to you in terms of the revenue exceeding the budget was primarily due to, to the fundraising efforts and us exceeding our fundraising goals. Thanks to the generous giving of you, our members and our supporters. We were able to also implement a planned giving program over the last couple of years. And we've received several uh, planned gifts into the, the planned giving program, which has really been wonderful. And so uh, the annual fund total was 251. And additionally, we took in an, an additional 25,000 for the endowment fund and some other designated giving so that our total giving for the year was 295,000. We had 65 new donors over the course of the year, and our participation rates, you can see at that bottom chart, uh, were much higher than they were the year before. So again, we are grateful for uh, the generous giving on the part of, of all of you. I just want to spend a quick moment to chat a bit about the endowment fund and our plans for that. You heard Steve uh, talk a bit about the endowment fund. and so. We're right now in the silent phase of a campaign that we will go public with uh, next summer, and we're receiving uh, gifts and pledges toward the endowment because part of our strategy to move the organization forward and, and uh, build our business model is to grow the endowment um, because the council feels strongly that this will bring fiscal stability and financial sustainability. And so you'll see just over the course of uh, a year here that the endowment has grown from 435,000 up to just over a half a million dollars. And like I said, we've received about a half a dozen planned gifts over the last year. And we are continuing to become aware of gifts um, that people have given as part of their estate. And so, very thankful for that and really appreciate your generosity in uh, giving to the ASA. 
uh, in terms of your resources of time, talent, and treasure. So thank you very much for that. And now I have the distinct honor and privilege of presenting the 50-year certificates to six longstanding members of the ASA. They collectively have 300 years of ASA membership. They became members in 1971, and so they've been members for 50 of ASA's 80 years. Imagine that. Several of them are with us here tonight, and so I'm delighted to honor Patrick Guire, who is from Hop Hopkins, uh, Minnesota. He can't remember how he became an ASA member, but we're delighted to recognize you, Patrick. David Ives is from Columbus, Ohio, and David became an ASA member through InterVarsity. And he recalls traveling to Europe with Bob Herman many, many years ago. And I know David is here with us tonight. He attended the 40 plus year uh, event last night. So congratulations, David. Dale Ritter is from Winchester, Oklahoma and his ASA awareness was through his Sunday school teacher, David Willis. How about that? And I know David is, is a member as well. Martin and Bonnie Price are with us today and tonight and were with us yesterday at the 40 plus year event. Martin is from North Fort Myers, Florida and his ASA awareness was through Roy Adams at OSU. Martin is an ASA fellow and past president of the executive council and has part, been part of our development committee. So congratulations, Martin. Next is Ronald Voss, who uh, hails from Ireton, Iowa, and his ASA awareness was through a Professor Russell Maitman. And we thank you for your longstanding membership as well, Ronald. And finally, Robert Sundell is from Clifton Park, New York, and his ASA awareness was an inner varsity group at Yale. And I had the privilege of hand delivering Robert's certificate a week ago when I was out in Clifton Park, New York. I know Robert is with us tonight. And I'm just going to end with a, a neat little uh, small world story. When I was visiting with Robert, we were at a coffee shop in Clifton Park. And the gal that took our order at the counter had a Westmont t-shirt on. And so we asked her if she was a Westmont student. Lo and behold, she was a biology student. She had Michael Everest as a professor and then proceeded to tell me that she was Jeff Schloss's niece. So we were in awe of that. And of course, we got a selfie and I emailed Jeff to let him know. So really neat. And again, congratulations to all of you. And thank you for your longstanding faithfulness to the ASA. And I'm going to turn it over to John now, and he's going to uh, induct the class of 2021 fellows. Very good. Thank you, Vicki. Folks, you're seeing the first of uh, a series of five slides that'll come up on the Class of 2021 Fellows. The Executive Council uh, considers and recommends fellows uh, that are gifted individuals with demonstrated leadership capacity and a combination of contributing to the ASA, um, vocationally contributing in their discipline or into the wider faith and science community. Uh, we have nearly 200 fellows in the ASA uh, out of our membership. And tonight, um, I'm just going to mention a word or two for each of them as we go by, you can see their titles there. And the details uh, for them will be in the fall edition of the newsletter. And you can read more completely about, the, about what they have done. And uh, we'll start here. Chris Bargar is a CSEA speaker and up in Montreal and, and has spoken across the country and at local chapters. He's an author, a pastor as well in Montreal. Mike Beidler. Washington, D.C., a local chapter leader and the leader of the team that's uh, planning our meeting in Washington, D.C. in a couple of years, and he's on the ASA Finance Committee. Hank Bessman, 
is an ASA author and perspectives and has contributed presentations on meetings. He is a emeritus professor and was a senior administrator and vice president, mentor of many students and program builder. Wayne Dawson is a, a researcher in physics, an ASA contributor and book reviews and other ways in the ASA. Uh, Danella Dietrichs is ASA meeting co-chair in, in our successful uh, Wheaton meeting. Appreciate that, Danella. And it's published in the uh, perspectives. Becky Eggman is an ASA workshop leader, has been active in there, developing uh, our local student chapter, an important. Dillard Ferris is an emeritus professor of physics at Wheaton and is uh, extended work in the ASA at the national and uh, at the uh, chapter participant level and uh, emeritus leader. And Stephen Freeland. And Stephen is a, a leader in biological sciences education and has been an ASA conference presenter at the local DC chapter. Appreciate his work. Joel Green is a, I think Becky, next slide, right? It's so small on my screen, I can't tell. A New Testament scholar, been an ASA author, a reviewer in the plenary sessions. Um, Matthias Hodge is a chemistry educator, laboratory uh, learning leader, and uh, in her institution, and active in the CWIS, the Christian Women in Science, and has been at ASA meeting. Charles Hunt is a leader of the Northern California chapter that's uh, being reinvigorated. He's uh, active in mentorship development with uh, students for the ASA and for potential members in the future. Deborah Schwinn is one of, you may not know this about the ASA, but she's one of three university presidents that belong to the ASA. And she has been active in, in uh, CWIS and in writing. Uh, Josh, yeah, next slide, please. And uh, Josh Swamidas is known to many of us at this meeting in particular. He's a leader in uh, the genomic medicine area, an author of Genealogical Adam and Eve, ASA presenter and the founder of Peaceful Science. Michael Tennyson is a senior administrator. He's an author in, uh, in perspectives and an ASA presenter along the way. And finally, Peter Walhout, professor of physical chemistry at, and at Wheaton and a local chapter active. And so these, this is your class of of uh, 2021 fellows, and we are so proud of them. They will have a reception, and I know some of them have friends that are uh, going to be with us tonight. We'll be at the reception right after this meeting. So please join me in, in uh, as you, telling them congratulations, and many of them you know along the way. So thank you seeing those come in in the chat. I turn now to the one of the more somber pieces that comes every year. These are our remembrances of members past and, and part of life in an, any organization and part of life for all of us is, the, uh, is our passing as well. And we pause, it's our tradition to pause. And usually when we're together, we do that. Um, in the book of Hebrews, we read the biblical heroes who walked in faith before us. In chapter 11, it sums up their lives by saying, these were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. But we know that as they knew that God is faithful and fulfills his promises. And so they act in faith and walked in faith. In this last year, the Lord has called away from their earthly work, 11 of our ASA members. These are the ASA heroes of faith. They're dear to their families. They're a great loss to their friends and their communities and to us. Our practice, of course, has been to pause each year. When we're face to face, we can do that and have, take a bit of time to have memories, but we're not able to do that in this context. Um, <clears throat> but there is the ASA page and the members in glory section. I would send you there uh, for reminders. Uh, and uh, you see all kinds of reminders that, that pop up. I've, I've been to that site repeatedly 
And Bob Geddes in the service this morning uh, reminded us about how important our uh, past members have been in our development. So tonight I'll read their names. Uh, and at the end, we'll take a, a moment of silence for our prayers together for them. Each of them has touched lives of hundreds, even thousands, for the sake of the kingdom, for the common good. They have run the good race. They finished their course. And we pray God's blessings on their memory. They are William Clark Duke, Jr., a theologian, and a fellow. Jennifer Hampton, a professor, Department of Physics at Hope College. And I will say an unexpected um, passing in her case. Edward Huff, professor, agricultural engineering. A Frank Matthews. Greg Morton. Stanley Parmenter. Satley Rowland. David Seaman. Albert Smith. Arthur Tuggy, a missionary, a church planter in the Philippines, and Gordon Violet Van Whelan, former president of Hope. Let us take a moment to read this scripture to reflect and thank God for their lives and contributions. May the Lord bless their memory, to their families, and to all of us. Amen. Thank you, John. We're going to hear from Michael Hahn now. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Michael Hahn. I'm a recent Gordon graduate. Um, but I first discovered the ASA during the process of writing an extremely difficult essay for an ecology course that I had taken at Gordon College. Uh, the criteria for the essay included difficult to grasp topics regarding science and faith, like the age of the earth, evolution, and the interpretation of Genesis 1. I found all of these topics extremely difficult to make an objective opinion about because of my upbringing. I was raised in a church that was not keen on accepting science and was taught in a school that was not keen on accepting religion. When I learned about faith, science was never really involved. And when I learned about science, faith was never really involved either. For such a long time, the creator, and creation seemed to be separate. It wasn't until I found an article about theistic evolution from the ASA that, uh, that things started to come together. I'm not saying that I have all the answers now, but the ASA certainly gave me a new perspective. After learning about the existence of the ASA, I was extremely interested in becoming a part of the organization. In about a year after writing the essay, I was appointed as the president of the Gordon College student chapter, which allowed me to be a part of the fruitful community that the ASA creates. On top of helping me write my midterm essay, the ASA gave me a community where I could explore these difficult ideas without judgment. You see, there have been many times that I have questioned science due to my religion and was labeled as an overzealous Christian who was trying to disprove science. On the other hand, I've also questioned my faith due to science and was labeled a heretic. Fortunately, through the ASA, I have found a community that allows me to ask difficult yet genuine questions and a community that gives me difficult yet genuine answers. While this, does, while this does include topics that I had to write about in my ecology essay, it also includes more modern topics like COVID-19, vaccines, and even abortion. Through the ASA's roundtable events and meetings, I have learned to thrive in not only my scientific understanding of the world, but thrive in my faith. I would not trade my experiences with the ASA for the world. Uh, so I'd like to hand it over to Hannah Eagleson, Hannah Eagleson to talk about the scholarship fund. Hello, in 2017, I helped launch the ASA Student Early Career Track, a collaboration of ASA and InterVarsity's Emerging Scholars Network. Today, we celebrate our fifth year of growth in that track. And it's also my pleasure to launch two new awards, 
the ASA Early Career Scientist Award, and the ASA Campus Ministry Award. Let's start with some storytelling. Many of you have probably felt a deep longing for a community who gets both your scientific work and your faith. In 2016, I connected with a graduate student named Heidi, who was doing something to fulfill that longing. Heidi was collaborating to build a network of Christians in the planetary sciences. We were thrilled to help publicize it. Imagine how much we would have loved to invite Heidi to an international faith and science conference with a vibrant early career track. But in 2016, we didn't have that at InterVarsity's Emerging Scholars Network. I didn't fully know it yet, but we were about to develop a transformative collaboration with ASA. ASA had a fantastic annual conference, but no established early career track. Many conversations and a grant later, we launched a new track at the 2017 annual meeting. We have been growing participation ever since with the support of Tom Grosh and then Bob Truby at ESN. As a way of celebrating and deepening our lay career involvement, we are launching our new awards today, supported by generous donors. The first award will help us celebrate scientists whose early scientific careers are encouraging models for others and who are making a significant contribution to science and faith conversations and communities. Remember Heidi, the graduate student I mentioned? In 2019, she came to the ASA Early Career Event as Dr. Heidi Fuqua Haviland. In 2020, Heidi went on to lead an ASA online early career track discussion group, and one of the participants was about to move to Heidi City. Heidi was able to connect with that person and welcome them to the area as a colleague in the same field. Today, we celebrate Heidi's contributions. A few highlights. Uh, her professional roles so far have included Northrop Grumman Aerospace Systems, Louisiana State University, and now NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Heidi is currently working on three NASA missions, and the Group for Christians in the Planetary Sciences she helped start now has 32 members. So please join me in sharing your congratulations with Heidi in the chat function. As you share, uh, we are also launching a Campus Ministry Award today. Many of you have experienced firsthand what a difference it makes to connect with a campus minister who cares about science. It's my pleasure to introduce Wendy Quay, a campus minister who nurtures faith and science conversations and helps build the communities that scientists need to grow over time. Some highlights of Wendy's career. She is a vocational discipleship specialist with InterVarsity's Pacific region. She studied with John Lennox. Uh, she launched many faith and work initiatives supporting science and tech grad students in the Bay Area. And she helped to build the Bay Area community of grad students that is now engaging ASA. Uh, so please join me in congratulating Wendy in the chat as well. It can keep adding to that. There's a lot to celebrate today. I'm deeply grateful for support in so many ways from the ASA community. From mentoring to encouraging words to financial giving, you are doing so much to support early career members. One of the most important factors in helping students get connected to ASA is financial giving to student scholarships and other support. As you are able, I welcome you to join in giving towards that now. You can give in the following ways, online at the ASA website. There will be a link in the chat. You can use Venmo at ASA, or you can send a check to the ASA office. Thank you all so much. It's a great pleasure to partner with you. I'll now invite John to return to the screen. This is an exciting part of the evening, folks. This is our upcoming meetings. Now, the brown baggers are going to be, a, that's a, we're thinking of as a quarterly. You know the diving deeper is monthly. But something you might not <clears throat> uh, recognize so much is we have quarterly prayer committee meetings. And those are rich moments. If, if God has gifted you with a, a, the gift of being a prayer warrior, be sure you job, drop in on these. These are special times. What a great group of folks praying for our ministry, praying for our members individually and supporting our, our members. And if 
if you have prayer needs, be sure to send them into the office. We collect those and we pray those. These are obviously quarterly meetings, so longer term stuff. But you should know on the side, your staff once a week is meeting and we pray for members at each of our staff meetings. Uh, the Winter Symposium is coming up and you see Phil Yancey's uh, photo here. Phil Yancey is going to be with us next winter and that symposium is our keynoter and uh, <clears throat> we'll be doing other things. He is working uh, through the writings of Jean Donne and it's really significant because of the, the pandemic in the days that Donne lived and he's going through his devotional writings and it'll be, I think, very informative, you know, as we think about, as we start to come out of this COVID pandemic and start reflecting on that. So that's really to be looked forward to. ASA in 2022, third time lucky. As someone said, we're <laughs> San Diego, here I come. You know, it's like, we want to be on the beach. And there are going to be some slides that come up here in a minute after I get done. And we'll come back to those and I'll give you the theme for the meeting. Then in uh, uh, the 50th anniversary of CSEA, we haven't said much about them. This is a partnership of great depth. It is a 50-year-old, long-standing partnership, and it is rich. Uh, and so we'll talk much more about that. Uh, that will be happening as a joint meeting together with our, our uh, CIS friends from the UK, and we'll do that international meeting looking forward to that. And then the Washington DC meeting, which was supposed to be next year, that uh, it was graciously that team allowed us to bump them out and they will bump out to 2024. So that's what's coming at us. And if you can show me the slides now of the, um, there you go, the location. And that it, it, it's all about location as they say in real estate and the boy, have we got location, uh, you know, coming up. And so, um, yeah, we'll look forward to being there. And, uh, and then field trips. And field trips are us, as they say, in the ASA. Um, and so that, that will be happening. In my, yep, there it is, hiding. There. Looking for my notes on, my, on our theme. The proposed theme for next year it really takes off in, in some directions and things that have come up here before. And that is the notion of what is a human flourishing now as a person. So the intention here is to turn to the social sciences in particular, and to bring out the notion of flourishing, but it's flourishing, not just <clears throat> from the social science, but as, a, as a Bill Jordan reminded us on council, when he heard this, Oh, flourishing, as an engineer, how does engineering help us in flourishing? And so we're, we're thinking of it in a multidisciplinary way. What is our theme of verse is Psalm 8, 4. What is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Or in Psalm 144, what are human beings that you think of them? Mere mortals that you care for them. This is coming up repeatedly in the Psalms, as, as uh, Steve reminded us tonight, you get repetition, it means pay attention. So every generation thinks anew about who we are. Uh, today, we have seen back-to-back -back prizes, uh, the Nobel Prize for CRISPR-Cas9 technology and gene engineering is just, just out, and the Templeton Prize then on the different direction to Jane Goodall, who frames research and meaning around a person. Who are we vis-a-vis -vis our closest relatives, the kind of behavioral sense that's been brought to bear? And so there are a number of keen things that are going on. And, and Jane Goodall is not only interested in the conservation of our nearest relatives, but she's also keenly aware of the planetary crisis that we face. How do we flourish in this dramatic change of climate that has gone on? What Catherine Hayhoe, one of our fellows from last year, called climate weirding, and, uh, and she speaks of that around the world. So we've entered a new era of cross-species transplantations. We're growing organs. We're planting them in. Uh, I'm aware as I'm losing hair, I'm not bald yet, but oh, I must be balding. How many hairs do you have to lose before you're 
bald. Well, how many cells and organs and systems do you have to replace until the transhumanists say, oh, you're a post-human, you're not a human. Very interesting questions that are arising around the nature of what is a human? And more importantly, how do we flourish as God wants us to? So that's our, that's our theme for next year. We're going to have to fill that out with all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, the, the challenge here for us has been when, when we couldn't go in person this year, we, we had two challenges in front of us. Number one, we have to come up with a virtual meeting and deliver that in about the next three months. And we had been obviously thinking about that ahead of time, but still, you know, that's the go button last March. And then the next thing we had to think about is, oh, that means we don't have content for, for San Diego. Can we take Washington, D.C.? No, that's not going to work. So we've got a planning team that's wonderful. It's met already. And uh, we're looking for some volunteers on that team still. And we're going to put together, I think, a program um, that will be marvelous. And I'm looking forward to being on the beach. Vicki. I'm looking forward to being on the beach too, John. So thank you. Thank you, Terry, Steve, Michael, Hannah. And hey, John, you may be losing your marbles and you may be a little bit bald, but remember, you're the young old guy, or, or should we say the young vintage guy? <laughs> Whenever John says he's old, I said, oh, no, John, you're not. You're just vintage. <laughs> So thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, it's been a wonderful three and a half days, and we want to stay in touch with you. We don't have time for Q&A right now. We're going to go right into the ice cream social. If you have any pressing questions, feel free to uh, email John or me or set up an appointment. We'd be happy to meet with you. Um, remember, the Sunset Pass will be coming out this week as well as a survey, so please take the time to complete that. If you're not an ASA member or an ESN member, please consider joining us. We'd love to welcome you into our memberships. And we just thank you again for being here. And, and God bless. And we'll see you over on the Ice Cream Social here in a few minutes. Bye-bye, everybody. And at, and at the fellows reception with me. Yes, that's right. The fellows reception, too. So we have and two Terry different and I will, Yep. Terry Gray and I will be there. All right. Enjoy, everybody. Take care.